Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the state of farming is always changing, and there was a lot to talk about at this year's meeting of the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation. We'll have a wrap-up of this year's event. This season has seen a volatile cattle market. Experts at One Beef Expo are offering their take on what we can expect to see in the new year. We're not lacking in lactose. Take a bite out of Eat'em Cheese. We'll find out how it's made, what makes it unique, and why it may be the perfect gift this holiday season. And sweet potatoes are crucial for Mississippi agriculture, but what about the spuds that are damaged during the harvest? We're heading to the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge to see how those discarded potatoes don't go to waste. Farm Week starts right now. Leighton Span. And I'm Troy Mullink. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. You know, Leighton, the end of the year, it's almost here. We're only, uh, only a few more farm weeks left in 2016. I know. Can you believe it? This year seems to have flown by faster mm -hmm. than most. And you know, we're getting very close to the end of the year, as you said, because Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation just held its annual meeting. That's right. And that's going to be our first story today. It's Mississippi's largest general farm organization. And made up of farm families seeking solutions to problems impacting the agriculture community. The 95th annual meeting just wrapped up in Jackson. As in years past, there was a strong turnout. It was a three-day event filled with lots of info tailored to the farming community. Some events included seminars for young farmers, award presentations, farm-to-table cooking, and updates regarding Farm Bureau leadership. The keynote speaker was Matt Rush, who you see right there. He's the former CEO of the New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau. He told the crowd, America needs farmers now more than ever. You're more valuable than you can even imagine. You're more valuable than we can put a dollar figure to. And we need you out there being visible, more visible than you've ever been before. Coming up on next week's show, we'll have even more highlights and information from this star-studded event. Well, this fall has not been the most encouraging time to be in the cattle business. Winter grasses have failed to emerge in pastures because of the recent dry weather, and that will down the road affect animal food supplies. Insufficient forage will also drive up farmers' input costs at a time when the market prices for beef are already down. But cattlemen's spirits at a recent beef expo were high, despite the present situation most are facing. Inside the Batesville Civic Center, it was standing room only for the North Mississippi Beef Expo and Cattlemen's College. With a decline in finished cattle prices of about $75 per hundred weight in two years' time, the volatile market was a topic of conversation. Cattle industry executive Andy Berry says, unlike what's happened at the auction barn, retail beef prices have been slower to come down thus weakening beef demand and causing cattle prices to drop more sharply and overshoot on the downside. You know, everybody seems to be in agreement that we've possibly got too high with our prices, but at the same token, I, I believe that maybe we're, we've overcorrected in the other direction. We have committed producers here that are they're always looking for ways to, to increase their profitability, to increase just their product that they produce. So, uh, you know, I'm just excited to see the great turnout here this, this morning. The overflow crowd of farmers in Batesville were encouraged by the market analysis presented by a noted livestock marketing specialist from Oklahoma. Darrell Peel believes cattle prices may have a bottom now and that the market is turning the corner. Maybe we've broken this uh, sort of bearish psychology that we've been in, uh, at, at least the fear-based part of that, and that we'll be able to move forward here with a little bit of, of stabilization and recovery in both feeder and fed cattle markets here for the remainder of the year. The Beef Expo featured analysis of feeder calf prices by Extension and MAFIS researcher Jane Parrish, and producers were briefed on a new three-year research project involving forages, 
An Oklahoma agronomist is looking into whether the use of summer cover crops impacts grass production in pastures during the winter months. We're just now beginning to, to measure our winter pasture uh, results from the summer cover crop now. Um, but just observationally, what we see is we feel like that in some of our no-till paddocks that had a summer cover crop, the pasture is developing a little bit slower than our no-till pastures that did not have a cover crop. But time will tell. We'll see. The event was a joint effort of Extension, Farm Bureau, and the Mississippi Cattlemen's Association. It was also presented in Hattiesburg for South Mississippi producers. From Batesville, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. From beef to row crops now, hundreds turned out for the 2016 row crop short course held near the campus of Mississippi State University. Those who attended received information regarding herbicide use, pest management, and the latest crop developments. A wide range of speakers were on hand to present the latest in crop research. Mississippi Commissioner of Agriculture Cindy Hyde-Smith was one of the speakers. You may recall that back in August, she was named to Donald Trump's Agricultural Advisory Committee. With his recent presidential win, she had some insight into how Trump is approaching agricultural policy in the new administration. He is not an ag person per se, but he is certainly surrounding him with people that I have confidence in. And, you know, that I'm willing to listen, don't think that I'm just going to get out there and make all these decisions with no input. That's not going to happen. Coming up on a future episode of Farm Week, we'll have a more in-depth look at how some new faces in Washington could impact rural America. Poinsettias, it's the plant everyone associates with Christmas time, but do you know how they are actually grown? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us how growers manipulate these plants into producing their radiant colors. There's no other plant that embodies the holiday season like the poinsettia. Southern Gardening is visiting Natchez Trace greenhouses getting into the Christmas spirit. Traditionally, red poinsettias are the first choice of many holiday gardeners. Prestige Red is a great choice, with dark green foliage providing the background to display its brilliant red color. Now I need to point out that the colorful flowers that we love so much are not flowers at all. They are actually modified leaves called bracts. Let's take a look at how the greenhouse tricks these bracts into changing color. Because poinsettias naturally change color in the short days of winter in their native Mexico, the growers use shade cloth to block light and trick the plants. After several weeks, this causes the bracts to start to show color. And as we get closer to the Christmas season, more color is showing, finally becoming a sea of radiant red. The real flowers are the small bead-like structures called saathia. Once you get your poinsettias home, carefully remove them and your plants will last longer. Here's a tip to help you choose your poinsettia regardless of color. Always choose a plant in proportion to the container. You can't go wrong with a poinsettia about two and a half times taller than the container. Poinsettias are available in many colors, shapes, and sizes, from tree form to four inch terracotta. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Garden. When you hear the name Mississippi State University, you may think of bulldogs and cowbells. But in this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us why we should also be saying cheese. under the tree. It's almost Christmas and for me there is one gift I love to receive every year. Say cheese. Eat them cheese that is. You don't have to be a fan of Mississippi State to be a fan of one of the university's signature products. MSU's Eat Em Cheese. 
Developed in 1938, the three pound Edam Cannonball has become a legendary cheese and a prized Christmas gift. Part of the cheese's notoriety comes from its trademark shape and packaging, but mostly due to its distinct mild flavor. The Edam recipe calls for fresh milk from the MSU dairy, cheese making acids and enzymes, custom shaped cheese hoops, a 48 hour salt bath, and a final dip into hot wax. With all the work that goes into each cannonball, it's no wonder that MSU Edam cheese is famous throughout Mississippi and far beyond. To find out more about Edam cheese or other specialty products, go to msucheese.com. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Let me get this, the MSU Cheese Store will sell over 40,000 Edam cheese balls this holiday season. I can actually believe that because it is so good. My family certainly loves it, yeah. Well, some people are lactose intolerant, not me though. I tolerate lactose all the time. I love this stuff. <laughs> Something else I could tolerate all the time though, the markets. What's going on in the news today? Well, a lot of optimism about the newly approved tool in the uh, weed fighting war chest, we might say, and I'm talking about dicamba technology. Will it alter input costs? But first, the top may be in for soybean prices. International paper completes a big meal deal while producers are moving cattle out. Well, despite its recent momentum, the soybean market may be about to put on the brakes, or so says trader Sue Martin, who's been looking at some historical trends, trends that may come into play again for soybeans. In years when you tend to have a, a low stock, a lower low in September, and then you close September higher, those years beans will tend to, yeah, go higher in October, and then they tend to tail off in through December and on into January. Now, there was five years of that since 1970. Okay. So it doesn't happen very often. And out of those five years, one of them did make higher highs in for the move from that September low in November. Even that one tailed off and disintegrated. So when we look at what's going on in the bean market, first off, new crop beans are basically running about, I wanna say 14% higher in, in price than what um, you had for your crop insurance here this past year. And the other thing is you've had Brazil looking pretty good in their weather. Argentina's a little dry though. Well, some might call it an early Christmas present for farmers who will be fighting weeds next year in herbicide tolerant cotton and soybeans. As we first reported last week, the EPA is now giving the green light to the use of Extendamax and Vapor Grip technology the crop input better known as the herbicide dicamba. We know that our producers have desperately been needing this to, to bring control to some of the pigweed and, and um, some other things that have been slipping through the glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate still controls a tremendous amount of weeds out there, but this adds a little bit to our, our portfolio of products to be able to properly manage the, uh, these weeds. And that's the key of it, is having that diverse portfolio to be able to manage these weeds. Shifting to forestry products news, International Paper now says it has completed the purchase of seven facilities from Weyerhaeuser. The $2.2 billion deal includes two pulp and paper mills in Columbus, Mississippi, a cellulose fiber mill and a modified fiber mill. Those mills employ over 400 people. The other mills involved in the sale are located in Georgia, North Carolina, Canada, and Poland. Well, it's time for our trivia quiz today on Farm Week, and here is the question. Mississippi is number five in the country in the production of broilers and what other commodity? Is the correct answer rice or grain sorghum or blueberries or soybeans? We'll have that answer for you coming up in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, Leighton talks with ag economist Brian Williams. A recent report on the cattle market is making some do a double take. And you've heard the saying, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Well, what about an invention using sweet potatoes? We'll drop by the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. See why these inventors are using discarded potatoes in the hopes of winning big money. It's a carb load you won't want to miss. Stay with us. 
Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. I want to take this opportunity to wish all of the Farm Week viewers a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas from the State 4-H staff. Merry Christmas everyone and remember to put your hay on the roof for Rudolph. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. From the College of Forest Resources and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Forest and Wildlife Research Center, Mississippi Agriculture Forestry Experiment Station. I hope Santa brings you some great gifts this year. Merry Christmas! This holiday season, make healthy food a factor in your life. Merry Christmas from Ag Communications. Happy Holidays! <laughs> Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas and Happy New Year! From all of us here on the Farm Week crew, Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Happy, happy holidays, holidays, and Happy New, New Year. A little surprise for the cattle market in the most recent on-feed report from the USDA. Extension's Brian Williams says that for one thing, cattle are coming out of the feedlots a little bit faster. Brian, would you say the headline out of these new numbers is that we have a faster pace of movement? Well, at least when it comes to coming out of the feedlot, we do. Um, going into the feedlot, it's a little bit slower. Um, but kind of running through the numbers, uh, we saw a lot of cattle move out of the feedlot, as I mentioned. Uh, marketings were up about 4.6% uh, from a year ago. That was a little bit higher than expected. Uh, placements were down 5% from a year ago. That was uh, slightly lower than what we were expecting. And then uh, with the higher marketings and the lower placements that left on feed uh, down about 1.3% from a year ago, which was a little bit lower than what we were expecting. So what's that telling the market when uh, placements are down like that? Well, a, a lot of what's going on is we've had a really mild fall. The weather's been real good in the Southern Plains. And so we see a lot of the stalker cattle operations and cow-calf operations having the grass and the wheat to put those cattle on, so they're putting them into, into the, the, keeping them out of the feedlot basically. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the feedlot wanting those cattle and they get a little bit of competition. So it gives a little bit of a bump to the markets. Now wasn't the market kind of expecting an even lower total number of cattle on feed figure? Well, they were, it was actually pretty close to what, what was expected. Um, when we look through the numbers, marketing is usually, a pre the marketing's number is usually pretty easy to project. Mm -hmm. uh, we just go back a few months and kind of look at the timing of when the placements were a few months ago to project that. The placements, we all knew that um, there were, there was the good conditions and that the producers were wanting to keep the cattle out. So when you put those two numbers together, it, it wasn't really too hard to project what the numbers actually came out to be. So does this report appear to show a market that can sustain itself where it is, or what, what might we draw from all this? I think in the short term, yes. Um, but with all these placements, the, the, the lower placements, all these cattle at some point are going to have to go back into the feedlot uh, to be finished out. And so we might see a run later on in the year when those cattle do finally hit the feedlots. And that'll probably bring the, the markets down. But at least in the short term, we've, we've got a little bit of a bump. And back to trivia now to wrap things up this week in the markets. And the answer is A, rice. Mississippi is number five in the country in the production of both broiler chickens and rice. Mississippi is considered the nation's sweet potato capital. The crop contributes about $82 million to the state's economic value. Unfortunately, about 30% of potatoes are discarded at harvest, but that doesn't mean they're unusable. With that idea in mind, Mississippi State University Extension created the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. As Farm Week's Amy Myers tells us, 
The challenge gives MSU students a chance to invent a sweet potato product using the discarded spuds that might otherwise actually not make it to market. We've all heard the saying, one man's trash, another man's treasure. And that could especially be true for Mississippi State University students in the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. MSU Extension Assistant Professor Dr. Jason Ward explains the goal of the challenge. Produce you buy with your eyes first. And so a lot of times there's some of that product that some of those sweet potatoes that maybe aren't as pretty as some other ones you would find in, uh, at the supermarket. So. Our goal was to try to create a project that could use those roots that maybe aren't the prettiest, that still have the same value, and to make really innovative value-added products from those roots that may otherwise not have a home. Ward says the challenge is integrated into a wide range of existing college classes at MSU, such as food science, agricultural information sciences, business, chemical engineering, and even fashion design. Ward says the challenge is a competition, awarding monetary investments to teams whose products show the most potential. At the beginning, each team pitches their idea to a panel of experts, similar to the hit show Shark Tank. If it's good enough, the panel will invest money for product development. The team spends the next several weeks creating and tweaking products, then reports back to the panel for a chance at more investments. This year, funding came from MSU Extension Seed Grant and USDA Higher Education Grant. MSU students Riley Hanby, Haley Bell, and Candice Killebrew developed a sweet potato-based cattle feed they named Bovine Batatas. The team says learning how to develop their own product offers unique challenges and lessons for the future. We kind of spoke with a couple different um, plant managers um, in, in different areas and found out what all um, usually goes in a feed, why it's put into a feed, and then from there we just kind of took all the information that we had learned and mix it together to make our feed. So far we've done three presentations and this is our third one so we're still, we're still working on whether or not if we're going to get investors from this presentation but as of right now we've gotten two different sets of amount of money from investors from the presentations that we've done. They brought in judges throughout the sweet potato industry and other professionals throughout campus that way they can give you um, feedback on your product and try to ask you questions that maybe you wouldn't think about when you're creating it and trying to see if you're actually serious about creating a business and seeing how far this will actually go. This has really helped me understand the importance of all of this just because um, our lives basically stem from agriculture and production and um, without the farmers we won't be able to survive and sustain so it really uh, makes me feel happy that I have an opportunity to kind of help benefit that. Riley Hanby says the team is grateful to MSU Extension specialists, researchers, and educators for helping turn their idea into a potential business. This process um, has definitely opened my eyes to what Extension can do for, for just the average person. Um, being a student, you, you sometimes get pigeonholed into the class mindset, um, but this project and this challenge uh, allowed us to expand our capabilities. Um, we were able to speak with um, individuals that, that know what they're talking about and know what they're doing and um, they were more than willing to answer anything that we needed to help us in any way that we can and so we're definitely grateful for the opportunity to, to make this product as well as the opportunity to work with them. With about 30 percent of sweet potatoes being discarded from the millions of pounds harvested each year, Dr. Ward emphasizes that generating profit from cold sweet potatoes could be life-changing for many people. These really are family farms and they're delivering value and we've seen that uh, the sweet potato industry utilizes a lot of labor and so for every kind of uh, every dollar that they make at retail a lot of that comes back in the local communities through a lot of different pathways so whether that's in the fields you know during harvest season or in packing and those kinds of operations uh, it's a pretty broad ranging market if successful companies are indeed born dr ward hopes they'll eventually return and reinvest in the sweet potato challenge being a superfood packed with vitamins, fiber, and micronutrients not found in other foods, the sweet potato could be a source for many product ideas still waiting to be discovered. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Layton, uh, before we started this package, one of the guys on our production crew called them Dud Spuds. That's right. And I liked that name it's a of good, them. Some good way to put it. Dud Spuds. But the, right. the, the students actually did their latest round of pitches 
just last week, and there were 20 teams that presented in this latest round. That's right, and some of the ideas this time included cosmetic, industrial, and even some animal products, and seven, seven of those 20 teams actually received funding. And looking at the list here, one of the ideas was a tanning spray called Sweet Skins, catfish feed called Tater Bait, and there was one team that tried to sell sweet potato eyeglass frames. They were called Appeal Frames. Some, some real creative ideas there. I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, good work those kids are doing. Yeah. All right, that's going to about wrap it up for this week's show, but good one in store for next week, too. That is right. Oh, Christmas tree. Oh, Christmas tree. Yes, grab your sled. We're going to a Christmas tree farm. Check out the different types that are grown right here in Mississippi. And it's apparent you're missing out when it comes to your fruit choices. We're dropping some knowledge on the food that always takes a back seat to apples and oranges, but its health benefits may surprise you. And do you want to go to the beach? Well, it's not for vacation, something much more important than that. See how folks are doing their part to keep the environment and marine wildlife happy and healthy. All right, just like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, only a few more farm weeks left until 2017. But thanks for joining us on this week's edition. I'm Troy Moley. And I'm Leighton Spann. We will see you next time on Farm Week.